Call in good in the back? Yeah. All right. Thank you, for everyone, for coming. I mean, there's always so many different things you can do with your time. So I really appreciate the value you coming out to, you know, to, to hear me uh, today. Thank you to Flyleaf um, for, you know, for hosting me. And uh, I, I think our, our Tom here. So we go way back. So we go back before even the first uh, book was published. Um, I, I guess I, I, I was just an aspiring writer at that point. And sent some emails to you and you respond. You know, a lot of times you get also in emails and you responded and you really helped me sort of craft some of my earlier pieces. So I just wanna, so it's really cool to sort of kind of bring it back, kind of bring back home. It's yeah, really well, cool. I, I was thrilled to meet you because uh, I'm a physician writer and to, to see uh, another physician writer uh, in, in kind of your formative stage because you were writing articles for Op-Ed, New York Times, Washington Post, you were before that, man. Even before that. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, um, but, but I could tell right away that Dr. Tweedy was a very gifted writer and had a lot to say. So it was thrilling to, to uh, meet you, what, about 14, 15 years ago. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I guess I just wanted to say, um, I guess I'll just, I'll just start with telling kind of, thanks for coming again. I'll just kind of give you a sense. So I've written two books, right? And um, in some ways, I see them as really um, kind of thematically connected in some ways, because, you know, basically taking, tackling really difficult topics. So the first book's about, you know, medicine's challenge of, with race. And I'm sort of using my own kind of experience and journey to sort of frame, you know, that sort of really difficult kind of terrain. Um, you know, this, this current book is really uh, talking about another really difficult topic, you know, mental health, um, and, and sort of framing my own experience and trajectory with that. Because um, as we'll probably talk about, I'm, if you would have seen me as a medical student, there's students out here in the world and college students here, you would have imagined me, I would probably be one of the last people you would have imagined becoming a psychiatrist. Um, so it's really, and so well, hopefully we can really sort of flesh that out because I mean, medicine really, um, it was the last thing I thought about doing and a lot of what I learned in medical school would have made me not want to do it either. So yeah, so anyway, but here I am. So that's the mystery of life, right? <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, you mentioned Black Man in a White Coat, and uh, I love that book, and uh, it dealt with Dr. Tweedy's uh, voyage through uh, medical school, and, and it was, in many ways, a story about your transformation uh, into becoming a doctor. And uh, the new book, Facing the Unseen, which I've read, it's fantastic. I love the book. Very different from a Black Man in a White Coat, but also the same in some ways. So. I want to start off uh, asking you, what are some of the themes in Black Man in a White Coat that readers will find in Facing the Unseen? Right, so, so the, the theme is very, I mean, so the, 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 the sort of narrative is very similar, the structure, like the idea of using sort of a chronological structure, starting with medical school and kind of going through the training process and then on the other end as a faculty member, but then sort of, um, using my encounters with patients and with staff to really sort of with other doctors and sort of really use that to illustrate sort of the um, the challenges that are sort of they're, they're just there every way. So, so in some ways you think about the parallels. So we think about race, we think about history, we think about civil rights movement, we think about how black people have been, you know, systematically, you know, oppressed in all sorts of ways historically. Um, I actually have another project that we'll hopefully we can talk about at some point, but I'm still doing work in that area as well. Um, and so that's obviously one narrative. Um, and so one of the things that, that sort of strikes me is that when we think about the history of race, um, there are things that happened, for instance, like Duke was segregated, right, until 1963. So, you know, my parents who were, you know, still doing well, they would not have been able to, you know, they couldn't have gone to Duke, right, when they were, when they were my age, when I went to Duke. Just, that was just the way it was. And um, there are things, I mean, the hospital was also segregated. And, and there's a story that I'm working on where there was a, a pretty terrible story where someone was sort of turned away because of the, the, the way the bed space allocation took place and had a really terrible outcome. And we're doing a whole sort of story that, about that. I'm not here to sell that, but it's a really fascinating story. And I think you'll hopefully some of you will be interested in that as, as that comes, uh, comes to pass. But the thing about that is that it's easy to sort of look back you now, 60, 70 years later, and say, well, how could Duke have done that? How could, you know, how could we have segregation? How could these things happen? It's easy to sort of, but I think it gives us a sort of comfort to look at things in that sort of way. Um, sort of, because it doesn't, it, it maybe makes us not interrogate what we're doing in our own time that might not be so good, um, that people might look back on. Because the thing I always wonder is, well, I can look back on Duke six years ago and say that they did wrong, but I, I wonder how people will look back on me and us 60 years from now, right? It's something that I think about. 
And I think one area where I think there's definitely a shortfall is how we deal with people with mental health, mental illness problems. And so I think that's, that's where I see the, the parallels. And so there are a lot of stories um, that I tell in the book that really sort of underscore how we, we're managing mental illness um, and people with mental health problems in a very a way that people look back on really um, with dismay. Uh, just to give you the most basic example, and then I'll we'll, we'll, we'll switch back. The most basic example is that you know if you have a, um, you know if I come in with a, an appendix that's, that's ruptured, or I come in with chest pain, or something that's considered medical, um, you know I get evaluated in the, in the emergency department, and I'm most likely to, with a serious I'm going to be admitted to the hospital where I'm presenting. You know, that's usually the sort of the way things work. But in the world of mental health and, and psychiatry, you know, you come to an emergency department, people come to a place like Duke from all over, they're coming expecting you know, a certain level of care because of the school's reputation. And then you come to a place like Duke, to the ER, and you have a mental health crisis, you don't just necessarily just go up to the unit. There's all these, these issues with bed space and who can go here and who can go there. And, and, and it, it reminds, in some ways, there's echoes of the past, because like in the past, like black people couldn't go to certain hospitals and they had to be transferred to other hospitals because, and so now it's a sort of similar parallel. So people with certain mental health problems, they can't be admitted to this hospital, they gotta go to this other hospital. And if you don't have insurance, you can't go to that hospital. And it's like this whole sort of horrible cascade. Um, and the person's just coming to seek you know, treatment, right, for a crisis, but it's, it seems so differently. And so I think that people will, will, will look back on that. And there's a, there's a whole chapter really sort of explores that in a really sort of, uh, you know, really troubling way because I'm the person who's in the middle of that. I'm the person who's sort of like stuck and, and it's part of the system. Um, and sort of trying to grapple with that, uh, the system that maybe you're, you're not necessarily, maybe you're even doing harm in a way that, and that's not what you certainly set out to do. And so there's, there's a whole chapter that really kind of explores that. So I think that's, that's the parallel between race, thinking about the past, and we think about mental health. Uh, and the challenge of people mental illness in the, in the present. I think there's certainly a lot of parallels um, that can be made. And that's what I hope to do with, with this book. Yeah, I, I hope we can get into more about how uh, patients are transferred from emergency rooms to, uh, let's say, inpatient psychiatric treatment. But before we do that, um, I just want to say that both of your books are about journeys. Uh, and, and I think it would help everybody understand the second book, really well if you talked about your own journey from growing up in Baltimore to deciding to become a doctor to deciding to become a psychiatrist. Can okay. you take us on that journey? Ooh, that's a long journey. I'm, 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 I just turned 50 this year, so that's a, that's like a long journey. <laughs> so I'll, I'll spare you some of that, right? Um, I think the most relevant parts are, so I, I, you know, I grew up in a community, so I'm a first generation college uh, uh, young person who's been recruited right now and um, my brother and I were and uh, my dad worked at a store like a, a Harris Teeter or a food line and, and you know, something like that it's called giant up there but a store like that my mom worked in kind of an administrative kind of secretarial kind of kind of role but I think a really important person in my story is my, my grandmother my mom's mom I talk about her in both books um, she grew up in the, she was born in the 1920s and she grew up in the sort of same part of Virginia where Henry Lack's story starts very same part same time in history as well and she was one of 12 children, and um, so her dad died when she was very young. She moved to D.C., became like she was like a maid or housekeeper. And so growing up, we would, my mom, we would go to church on Sundays and we would visit her after church. And she really helped, uh, and so she was some of my first ideas of like someone encountering the healthcare system. Uh, she was, so so she, she talked about sort of this issue of not trusting a doctor that she saw. I didn't understand what that meant at the time, but it's sort of now as I got further along in life, it sort of resonates, you know, some of the experiences. She also was someone who was very, uh, can I use the word high strung or, or hyper or I'm not sure how you would describe it. So she was very sort of demonstrative and she would like have these, she would kind of come up and sort of like, um, you'd, be in a, you'd be just talking a casual conversation and she would like kind of pop up and start like, like a lawyer in a closing argument. She was very like, just <laughs> very, very, extremely passionate, very, very so much so. Um, she also was a chain smoker and she paced a lot and um, so one day, one of her friends from church told her that maybe she's like too stressed out and maybe she should like find a way to sort of calm herself down kind of thing. My grandmother kind of went in her little sort of, you know, closing argument mode and <laughs> is like, you know, if you know me, you know my history, you know I have every right to be. This is this is how, I'm a strong black woman, basically. We kind of heard that narrative. And so, you know, I'm a really strong black woman and I, I face so much, this is how I, this is my coping, this is how I deal with life. Um, so that was her, and that was, that was, the door was closed. But she also had a daughter who was my, uh, my, uh, my aunt, my mom's sister who was also pretty similar in some ways, but she was also prone to things like um, being more reclusive. And she would have these spells where she would get really depressed. 
um, and she also was very anxious and things of that sort. But it was never conceived of as having a, um, you know, no one conceived of her having a mental health issue. It was as my grandmother would say, well, she's just not strong enough, or she's kind of like, she's just not doing right, or she's kind of, something about her is just not right. And so there's a lot of people who sort of grow up with that sort of thought about mental health issues. It's not really a thing, right? And so my mom would say, well, why would someone, because we even talked about my aunt, why would someone go to see a, a, a someone like yourself uh, and sit in an office and describe all your problems? Like, what could, what could you do for her? And so it was like, you know, why, why, you know that was sort of the, the world that I grew up in. Um, so I think what's interesting about my journey is that, so when I got to um, medical school, psychiatry was the last thing that I was thinking about. I think this, I think it's something that's interesting. So like, I know I got several students here. So like some are going into like, you know, different fields in, you know, general medicine, surgery, cardiology. I don't think you enter into those, those, those fields with a, necessarily a preformed negative impression of them. It's like, well, you know, like I thought about, my, my dementia, I thought I was gonna become an orthopedic surgeon or a cardiologist. Those are the things that I was interested in. And there's no sort of, it's almost like there's a sense of like, well, these are heroic fields. I can come, you know, save the day kind of thing. If anything, I, I came to med school with negative thoughts about mental illness without even knowing it. For me, it's, it's, like, it's like a subtle thing. You, you, so um, I had an uncle who was a war veteran and, and had been in World War II and had significant alcohol problems and was homeless. And all the disruption that that caused in his life and his family's life. Um, I talked to my grandmother and my aunt, right? And so I had sort of maybe kind of negative impressions that people with mental illness or problems are like not something I want to be around, right? And so I'd already entered that without even knowing it. Uh, and so, when I entered that first day of you know med school, when I started my you know my start my rotation, psychiatry was kind of the last thing I ever thought I wanted to do. Yeah. Orthopedic surgery, cardiology. That was that was I was all in on those fields. Um, and so, this is something I think is really important. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to continue or yeah, please. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I get going. And I was like, oh, it's hard to stop. There's so, there's so much to tell. No, but this is really it's really important. I think for me because so when you get to med, when I got to med school, it's been you know many years now. Um, I didn't like psychiatry, um, but I also think there were things, the way it was set up, it also made it condition students to not, to also, it also, it made the problem worse. I was put it that way. So you would think that you get to med school and people might, it might be more, teach, might be more humane way of thinking about mental illness and those sort of things. But when we got to med school, people were like, really, a lot of doctors I was around were really talked bad about psychiatry. You know, they, they said people, someone said that one of my, uh, over faculty said, only people that go to psychiatry are, are students who can't cut it in other fields, oh. or or students who are crazy, right? And that was that was the perception. And he said, "Well, you know, it looks like you can cut it academically, so that means you must be right." You know, that's terrible, right? Isn't that terrible? But so it was already sort of framed that way before you even even sort of walked in the door. Uh, and, and and my rotation, this is really, I think this is also telling. So. When I was a, you know, in med school, you do you rotate through surgery and OBGYN and feeds and these sort of things. Those rotations occurred in the hospital. They occurred at the main hospital at Duke or in clinics right nearby. My psychiatry rotation, so it was at a the state facility, and I had to drive 30 minutes away. So it was a separate, totally separate from everywhere else I had been trained. The first day there, you, you drive by and you see a sign that says there's a prison on to the left and there's a juvenile detention center to the right and there's like a you know it's, it's like well what is this and, and what have i got myself into and why is it different so it's already sort of setting it up to be something that's different um so that was sort of my kind of my introduction to psychiatry that it was something that you know i didn't want to be a part of basically um and so a story that didn't get into the book i just tell it absolutely psychiatry also <laughs> didn't want me um they got my this my worst rotate probably because i was coming into it with negativity it was the worst rotation. I actually had the lowest grade in, in med school uh, in psychiatry. Um, and then but yeah, I'll just tell a story, then I'll I'll turn back to you. Um, <laughs> so no, so this is it's, 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 I think it's just telling though because uh, so at the end of the rotation, we had to interview a person who I'd never met before. who was an inpatient on the on the psych unit, um, and there was a faculty member who was, who was observing the interview who I'd also never met. And so you're there in this room, and you get 30 minutes. You know, if you're in student wow. mode, you're like, we got to get this thing done. And so this guy, as you can tell, I talk extremely fast, particularly when I get sort of worked up. And uh, this patient talked very slowly, very <laughs> slowly. And I had 30 minutes to get all this information from him to figure out what was going on and to come up with a plan so I could share this with my faculty member and tell him, make him know that I understood the basics of, of evaluating someone with a psychiatric illness. And so this thing did not go well. I was uh, cutting, I, I was going, he wasn't answering questions in the way that I needed to get the information that I needed. This is a really great lesson about 
medicine today in general, right? But I was rushing through things and I started to cut him off and put words in his mouth. And at the end of that session, a faculty member says, so Damon, uh, what do you want to do with your life? <laughs> so that's probably a bad sign, right? I shouldn't tell him that was a bad sign. And so, uh, and so I told him I'm interested in orthopedic surgery and cardiology. That's what I want to do. One of those two. And he said, well, you know, those are good fields, but you have to know how to talk to people even if you do those fields. And, and based on what I've seen, I'm worried about that. And I think maybe you should consider pathology or working the land. Like, so that was my that was my introduction to psychiatry. So somehow out of all that, I became a psychiatrist. <laughs> well, as you were talking, I realized that surgery didn't want me. And, um, and it was probably a good thing that they didn't want me. Um, so let's continue this, this chronology a yeah. little bit further. So you had this rotation at a state hospital. I think we all know where that hospital was. And uh, you go into a um, internal medicine residency, right? And during that first year, something happens in that residency that makes you totally reevaluate your uh, career choice and also your perception of psychiatry. Do you want to talk about that particular incident and how it shaped your uh, career arc? Yeah, so it's actually a couple of things. So I started out in so internal medicine is like the, the, the sort of the, the prelude to so three year residency. That's the prelude to become a cardiologist. So at that point, I decided against orthopedic surgery and I was going to do cardiology. So I was already on that path. I was, you know, it was all, it was all within sight. Um, I think a couple things happened actually that that, that changed began to change my uh, perception. One was that when I worked at the state hospital and it, it, you know those people, all the people that I'd seen were people that I'd never seen or met them for the first time in their sort of condition where they were you know severely ill. I had not seen them in, in this sort of other state before. Um, and I think that's part of the challenge we face with mental illness in our society is that there's kind of this us against them kind of thing that and this is a, some of us sort of imagine that people with mental illness are sort of fundamentally different and that we could never be that way and, and that no one that we cared about could be the way this seems may seem naive but i think it's very much something that, that that carries in our society we see someone who's homeless and we do we think about what that person might have been like at some other time or where they could still be or do we just see someone who's like a person rambling to themselves you know i, th I think these things we all we should be thinking about when we, when we see people in that way um and so i was certainly that that sort of mindset but then one day I come down to the ER and we're supposed to um, medically kind of clear somebody. This is like a person who's acting in, a, in sort of an unusual way behaviorally and you have to make sure there's no medical cause, like there's no brain tumor or something that may be explained, right? Some unusual infection or something like that. And so as part of this medical evaluation, I go down to the ER and I see someone and I recognize them. And it's like my, and I just get like, it's like what's, what's going on here? And my, couldn't move, I felt like they were planted to the ground because it was someone that I'd known and, and known pretty well and we'd done a lot, spent a lot of time together. I hadn't seen him in years, but I was like, how could he be here? Like I knew him as this other person. How could he be here in, in a state that's totally you know, different? And it was eye-opening for me to sort of experience that way, experience the idea that you know, you could, it made me rethink a lot about all the other people I had seen with mental health problems and then saw later, you know, that they weren't just in that one state that they were, that they were in at the time that you saw them. And I think that's the problem with medical education. It kind of makes you see people only in their sort of most distressed, challenged, worst states rather than this whole people. It's one of the big challenges, the critiques I have. And so I saw this this guy and I was like, wow, what's happening? And so that really was a first thing. That was the first sort of uh, thing that really kind of got my eyes open. Um, then I also saw a time, in, another time in the, ER, in the ED where a woman had come in and she was basically uh, frozen. Like she wasn't, couldn't talk, she couldn't move. And, uh, but she had, but it was medical because her blood pressure was really high, her heart rate was really high. So there was like, it had to be a, a medical reason why. And so, the, so the, the ER doctors were, they didn't know what was going on. And this is what they had to do. So they had to page, this is just giving a great example of the problem. So they had to page the psychiatry resident so they could see her medical record. So at the time, the medical records were totally separate. There was a medical chart, and then there was a mental health chart in the same facility. And the only way you, and so the and doctors couldn't, you, students probably don't imagine. So you couldn't actually see the, if you were in the, in the general medicine side, you couldn't actually see the mental health record. It was blocked off. All you could see were what meds the patient was taking, but you had no idea what was going on. So they paged the psychiatry resident just to figure out what was in her record. And then the psychiatry resident saw her 
and he, and he came with the diagnosis pretty quickly. And they were really skeptical. And he said, well, she has catatonia and she needs this particular, she needs like adenine, which is a drug that often slows people down. But in this case with catatonia, it actually has a paradoxical effect. And they were really disbelieving, but it actually worked. And it was an amazing thing to see psychiatry, how, you know, you know again, how psychiatry, how psychiatry could work, how the mind and body could, could, could be together. So those things, coupled with the ideas, I got more into cardiology, I kind of realized that the parts about cardiology that I like, I really like EKGs. <laughs> I had a pink EKG, I don't know, I just I really like it. And so I realized that part of, that part of, uh, that part of medicine, cardiology was becoming more and more procedural and more focused on like doing the, you know, technical procedures, and I was less interested in that. I was more interested in the kind of cerebral side of it. And so I was realizing that that was probably less and less what I was interested in. And it took a long time, though, to, to think about being a psychiatrist. So after that one event, when I saw that woman get really well from the, cat, from the catatonia, the next day I go up and I talk to um, my, uh, the, the, the faculty person who's, who's taking care of her now. And I said, this is really neat. And she says, well, are you interested in psychiatry? And I looked around, I was like, no, of course not. <laughs> I'm interested in, I'm gonna be a cardiologist. Yes. And then, but, then, but then I said, and then, I, then I realized it was me and her together. And this kind of gives you the idea of the kind of the shame that kind of goes with going to a field like this. Because, um, so I went and I went and closed the door. And I said, can we talk some more? And then she started to tell me more about what psychiatry could be like. Um, because I, as I told you, you know, coming from the family I came from, when you're a first generation student, particularly a black person, um, who doesn't, their family doesn't really think mental health is a real thing. Um, tell them that you're gonna do psychiatry is like basically telling them that, you, that you're just gonna like drop out. You know, you, you came to med school to be a cardiologist or orthopedic surgeon, you know, like a real, a real doctor, right? Yeah. And the idea that you would do this other thing. And so there was, it really, it really was like a, but, that, but that's, that doesn't make sense, but that's, you know, we, we can say that doesn't make sense, but that was also the reality. You know, I said, this is person. You know, like when my grandmother died, uh, I know I'm going off script. I'm, just, I'm, I'm prone to this. So my grandmother died, uh, just to give you a sense of kind of what my family was like and, this, and sort of this idea. So she died when I was in medical school. And um, they actually, uh, at her funeral, they brought me up at the funeral to basically, the, the, the pastor it brought me up to sort of show that I was an example that her life in some way had been valuable. Or had meaning. I mean, it was a really, you know, it just, it just sort of hit me. It was like, so there was this intense pressure that I was sort of carrying. You know, she, you know, she was a, she was a share, her family was sharecroppers. And so maybe, you know, just, just, you know, just abject poverty. And it's in the sense that I was somehow sort of carrying the family. And the idea that I would do psychiatry felt like it was, was a really, it was a hard thing for me to even admit to myself that I was interested in it at that point. <coughs> if that makes sense. It was because it was just such a, such a burden that I was carrying with my, with being that first in the family was to sort of carry that weight. But it's a sad reality that, that psychiatry is seen that way. And that's a, that's the whole reason why I'm writing this book, to try and get it out of the darkness, right? And to think about it differently. Yeah, uh, as you talk, Damon, it makes me think of his intense sensitivity to other people. And uh, it comes across in, uh, in the way he talks about his patients, the way he writes about it. And it came across in the book in the latest book, Facing the Unseen, when uh, you were working in the emergency room, uh, I don't know exactly what year of the residency this was, and uh, a woman comes in and you examine her and she's she seems pretty well put together, but is having some, I don't know if it was delusional or uh, uh, self-harm thoughts, and you feel, and, and you know that your attending feels that you can't let her go uh, leave the emergency room and expect that she'll uh, be able to uh, not hurt herself before the first clinic appointment. And so the only alternative is to send her to the state hospital. And you call um, uh, the emergency department calls for the police oh, yeah. to put her in a police car and I believe she wears has to right. uh, put on yeah. cuffs right. just as if she were a criminal right. Right. and she's taken to the state hospital in that way um, obviously not how any patient who comes in the emergency room would be treated if they were simply going to go upstairs to a medical ward exactly. so so 
Tell us how that uh, particular incident shaped how you view this disconnect between medicine and psychiatry, yeah. at least at the time that you were yeah. uh, going through your training. Yeah, I, I think the quick version is basically, I, I told you about the idea that there were separate medical records, right? Which just seems like doesn't make any sense in retrospect. Um, you know, mind and body, really, they're that, I mean, they're all connected, right? But it's like they're just totally separate. So this is the same same thing with, with decisions that we make as far as working to go to, to the hospital. So can you imagine, so I started to tell these stories to like the two or three. So you, as a resident, you see the person first and then you call your faculty person who's using the phone. And I started to, to, to tell the story and he cut me off. And he's like, uh, what's her insurance? Like, the because the, the, the other part doesn't matter, which is like, it's such a, but that's, and it's so striking. That's not something that would, would have ever happen in, on the whole time I was in the, the sort of medical leadership, where that would be the very first thing, really the only thing that would determine next steps. And so that's just, so that our system is set up to really separate them out in ways that are really detrimental to patients. I, mean, I think that's the, the bottom line. The second thing is, um, why, if you have to go to the hospital, why do you have to, how do you get there? So most times you transfer a hospital, hospital transfer is ambulance, right? That's what we think about. And so, and in many states, that's actually the case for mental health as well. But North Carolina is, is one of those states where that's not the case. Well, at least it wasn't at the time. That's starting to change a little bit, but um, where the default is sheriff and police. And you guys probably heard lots of stories in the media, right, about, you know, what we call 911, mental health crisis, first person is there as a police officer who's not necessarily trained to deal with these issues. And so that, that, that sort of thing perpetuates on this side as well. And so that story really just underscores all those sorts of things. Um, and, then, and then how do I navigate that as someone as part of this sort of system trying to make it better? And so that's really the, the tension that's, that's told in that story. Yeah, so thankfully, I, thankfully that happened now, as I tell in the chapter, because you know I tell these stories that are really difficult, but I'm like, well, how would it be different now? And thankfully for a lot of these stories, some of these actually would be better. And so I kind of go into what's changed and what would actually be better, sort of give you some hope. But, 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 it's, but it's important to understand how we got here. But now it's, it's for us to figure out how we can move forward. So, so how is psychiatry changing now and yeah. becoming more a part of medicine? Well, um, I look at some of my students here. <laughs> <laughs> I think there, I think there are some former students. Yeah, uh, I, I think there's a couple of things that are that are better, um, that are getting better. Um, you know, one of the problems still is that psychiatry you, you, you mostly learn as a student in this sort of acute setting where people are at the sickest and most vulnerable. So you think about someone who has alcohol problems. Where do you see them? You see them in their intoxicated or in control. Do you see someone who has alcohol problems who's actually had problems and is actually doing better? You usually don't. And so that kind of conditions you to think about people with certain problems in a certain way. I think, I think so there's efforts underway to try and make that better. Because part of the problem in med school is that you often won't see people only in that kind of state. So how do we see people in this sort of, in a, in a, in a, in a different way? A couple years ago, and I have a group of students from here, but it was like a couple years before you guys. Um, I had a student who saw a, a, a patient in the inpatient hospital setting, she had schizophrenia. But then, but then later in the year, we went to this place that's like a, it's sort of like a, it's a clubhouse where people who are sort of have chronic illness uh, are actually trying to do better and are, are getting vocational training and, and they're, they're doing things more independently. And so he saw this same person in that, in that setting six months after he had seen her in, in his, her most distressed state. And he couldn't believe it. He was like totally like blown away that that could be the same person. Um, and it was like the idea that, because he totally had that disconnect. This woman could always be this way. She could never be this other person. And then really, he wrote this really powerful essay about it. And it really, I think it helps students, because you have to see people as more full, right? This idea if we only see people as illness, and as body parts, and as disease, it really conditions us to think about things in that way. So there's more opportunity in medical school now. It's still a work in progress to see people more in that sort of kind of either longitudinal way or more whole way. And I think that's what I'm really, that's part of what I do as a student. I mean, as a, as a professor. It's always happening, but it's slow. Yeah. Um, well, I'm sure those of you probably have questions you'd like to ask of, of Dr. Yeah. Tweedy. So shall we open it up? Can, can, I, can, I, can I do one more thing before we before Oh, we yeah, out? please. There's one story in the book that's really kind of, I think it's really telling also, um, it's worth telling about. This one you want me to talk about anyway, so I think I'll just bring it up. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it's really telling because um, it's a, uh, even once I decided I was going into psychiatry, I still probably had a really, uh, had a very narrow biologically oriented, uh, medically oriented way of even thinking about that. And, and I don't think I really could appreciate the patient side until this one incident happened while I was an intern. Um, you know, it's a hard story to tell, but it's important for you guys to sort of understand perspective. 
So this is this is the end of internship. So at this point, I'm, I'm still, I'm already signed up to go into psychiatry, but I'd never seen anyone from any, I'd never seen a psychiatrist myself personally, or a psychologist or a therapist, never. Um, I think of myself as psychologically healthy. Um, my wife and kids might disagree sometimes, but generally I think of myself that way. <laughs> and uh, um, so I, and I don't say this as a badge of honor, it's just a reality. So after I was a, probably out of grade school, I might have cried twice uh, after I got out of like, you know, third, fourth grade, twice that I could remember. Once was a, a senior in high school, I was an avid basketball, and I was a basketball player and it was the state playoffs. And I had a chance to like uh, send the game into overtime and I missed the shot. And you guys see those, those, those guys with the NCAA tournament, you know, the, the March Madness and, the, and they're crying. I mean, you, cause you put so much into it and it's all over just like that. And so that's how I felt in that moment. You know, my high school career was over, you know, and so I felt really sad, I started crying. So that was one time. The other time was when my grandmother, you know, when she died, uh, when I found out about that in her funeral. And that's it. Um, so I never imagined myself crying this one night you know, when I walked into this uh, ER shift. And so I'm, I'm, you know, there's a patient we admit, and he has a, he has cut to the chase of the He, he has, uh, it's called a ascites. He had a long history of alcohol use and he had liver failure. And he had, and so I basically, he was admitted to the hospital. We had to drain fluid off of his abdomen. Um, I was actually pretty adept at doing a lot of those procedures. I'd done, you know, I'd, I'd gotten pretty good at that point. I sort of enjoyed it, um, you know, drawing blood, you know, putting needles in LP, all that kind of stuff. I kind of got adept at it, even though I was going into psychiatry. But this one day, I just couldn't get it to work. Um, couldn't get it to work. And so I put the needle in, um, nothing comes out. Put the needle in again, nothing comes out. And, um, you know, and, and then I just, I swore, which is like, I, and then to use better language, in the moment, and my resident's like, well, what are you doing? You know, it's not like the patient's under, under an anesthesia where you can, you know, say whatever. Um, it's like, what are you doing, man? And uh, I didn't realize, it was like, it caught me by surprise too, what I'd done. Uh, he said, just just take a break, I'll take care of this procedure, go work on the rest of our patients. And so I went back into the into the workroom with this medical student, and um, I don't know what happened, but at that moment, I kind of just lost it. And so I had a clipboard, and I like flung it across the room, and I just started using all kinds of expletives which is not my sort of personality. Um, and, then I, and then the medical student was like, it's gonna be okay. Um, medical student, I'm supposed to be the other way around. I'm supposed to be comforting the medical student. <laughs> the medical student's comforting me. He said, well, my sister's also an intern. And I know how hard this is. So he was comforting me and that really just kind of just really took me, took me aback. Um, so the next morning I went and talked to the chief resident, you know, so I kind of felt, well, this is gonna get out in some way. I don't know, I just felt something that I had to just say something. So I went and talked to him. And I was thinking, well, he's going to tell me I need to do more procedures to get more confident. That, that's the way that I, my brain worked at the time. And he's like, you know, I think you're a little worried about you. And it sort of took me aback. Um, and he said, um, you know, I seem really stressed out. And um, maybe you should take the take a day off or something like that. And then I don't know what happened. But at that moment, it just hit me. And I started crying. And I couldn't stop crying. And then, again, it's never happened. I'm someone who sort of never sees myself very much indoctrinated into the I'm a man, it's masculine, men don't do that sort of thing. Very much that kind of person. You know, I'm a, you know, I'm a sports guy, I'm tough, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? That was my mentality. Um, and so like, I'm crying in front of this other this guy, this other grown man, wait, what's happening? Um, and then we talked some more and he said, I think you should talk to the, uh, it's basically like an employee assistance kind of person, like a person, you guys probably familiar with that sort of kind of person, to talk about what's going on with you. And so a day or so later, I went there. Again, I'd never been to a, any kind of mental health thing at all. And I walk into the room, I walk in there and I, I had on a sweatshirt of some type. I put the hood over it because I didn't want anybody to see me, yeah. uh, you know. And so that's the shame that I was bringing into that moment, right? Um, but then I felt better, right? Cause I'm like, you know what? I'm also a really tall black guy. If I walk into this <laughs> with this thing in my head, I might have bigger problems. <laughs> so let me take this thing off. And so I, and so I went in there. I mean, it's just the truth. And, 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 and so I went in there, and then um, I saw this as a social worker. He was like an employee assistance person. And in that moment, I realized like how much vulnerability I had, because I realized like it, it really made me appreciate the patient side in a way I never really appreciated. Because this guy was here, and man, maybe he could, maybe he would say I can't go back to work. I worked so hard to get here, and he has this power over me that I never really appreciated. Um, and you know, and how's this gonna go? And you know, I'm sort of at his whim. And it, it really it really made me appreciate how patients could come to doctors in that same state in a way that I never truly appreciated. Because when you're an intern, you're thinking about 
how everybody, the world is against you, and everybody's telling you you gotta do this, and you're the one that's the, the kind of quote unquote the victim. That's how you sort of feel, because you, you, you get so much thrown at you. you. You lose sight of how much power you actually have in that moment with people and how vulnerable they are. Maybe they come to you in their worst moment, the worst day they've ever had. And, and so it's something I never really appreciated until I was in that moment. And so I've carried that with me uh, you know, ever since. Um, even though in the end, you know, the evaluation went well, I was fine. I was able to go back to work in a couple of days. So it was nothing long standing. Internship just sucked and I was stressed out. Um, but but in the end, but in the end, I was okay. But it was a lesson that I never forgot. And it's something that I, that I brought with me as I see patients and I constantly try and talk to residents and students about that. To hold on to that, you're coming into that moment and you don't know what you're walking into. And you have to honor that that person, you don't know what that person's experience, you have to sort of honor that. And not think of make it about yourself, but also understand the power that you might have with that person and how you can do right by that. Use that power for good and not for not for bad. So that was just, that was just like a, a powerful, important lesson to be on the other end of it. Yeah, you know, I, I teach my students that a really good story has a series of moments. And in his in this book, that moment is a transformational moment uh, in, in Dr. Tweedy's life. And, um, and, and what you what you say in the book is after you have to take a week off, right? And after the week, you really felt like a different person. You were rested. That that anger and, and self destructiveness that you felt at that moment um, somehow dissipated. And, and that was I looked at it as as a curative uh, moment for you. Am I am I right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, Dr. Linda. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and, and the other thing, as you were talking, you know, I was thinking about my internship, and there's uh, my wife's here, and she knows what I'm talking about here. There's a picture in my office of, of me in a white coat during my internship. I am so depressed. So depressed. And I, and I keep that picture just to remind me of how I've changed or what I've gone through. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people don't appreciate how the stress of that one particular year is so immense. And I, I think it actually, in some ways, shapes doctors and not for the good. Do, do, you, do you have a different opinion of that? I, again, I think it's getting better. Um, I got some people who are about to enter, so I gotta, I gotta tell them. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's true, it's true. They're, they're, it's not that bad. No, 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 no but it is true, it is true. So I actually talked, I actually went back in the book, because I, again, I always bring, this is my experience then, what would it be like now? And so I went back and talked with the, some of the, the people who were, um, who were in the leadership positions, you know, now, who would have been people I interacted back then. And it's, there are definitely things that are so different. Um, and it's like things that are, would have been hard to imagine. The culture is, is very different now. People talk about the idea that they may talk to a therapist. Like that's not like something that you, you can't expect. If I would have said that, you know, at, at the time, it would have felt like I was just confessing that I was weak, that I wasn't strong enough to handle this. Um, that's very different now. I hear students talk about it and, and, uh, and there's even space for it in a way that is very different. Uh, so I'm really encouraged and, and hopeful that you know that, that things are, are definitely heading on the right track. Of course, change does not happen overnight, right? Yeah. But I think things are definitely heading in a much better direction than they once were. We've kind of been forced to, right? Because I mean, COVID during COVID, we saw how much there was a lot of stories about doctors struggling. You heard, you heard just some well-known stories about doctors who had died from suicide. There's all sorts of things that had happened, and so I think people have been forced to sort of confront these issues in a way that they um, had not uh, previously. So I think we're definitely heading in better to um, you know, so, so, so I'm thankful that the students now won't, won't have the same experiences. Sometimes the old doctors will say, well, you know, I wish that back in my day, um, we were, you know, this. I'm actually thankful that, you know, you, that you all have, are having a, a better experience um, than the one that I had. So that's, that's sort of how I see it. I'll, I'll second that. I, I teach a communication course, uh, co-teach a section for the UNC Medical School with third year students and one of them's here. And I, I am so pleasantly surprised at how different medical students are now from yes. back in the, the Stone Ages when I was. And uh, I say you Yeah, <laughs> but but uh, it really is a changed environment. Yes. So uh, what do you think that uh, we take questions now? Yeah. Yeah, okay. And I do want to read a little passage before we end, but I want to take questions. I'm, I love the question part. I'm a psychiatrist after all, right? Yes. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks for, for coming. Writing this book, yeah. and we all, I think, are excited to read it. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking about.
about the experience that you had, the you know, kind of transformative experience, I worry two things. One thing that I worry about is there's so much about the world we live in and the stories we tell ourselves about who we're supposed to be that that we make ourselves, not, not we make ourselves, that we're susceptible to intense emotion, but kind of our social structures don't have any way of embracing those intense emotions. Um, and then they kind of manifest in depression and anxiety and so on and so forth, which is to say, I just wonder, I mean, on the one hand, you've got the DSM, and all of our different criteria, but I really do feel that there's there's something about the depression and anxiety that's not pointing inward to us as much as outward. That to, society is sick. It, it I'm kind of saying that. And then the weird <laughs> other thing I want to say is, on the other hand, I feel like a lot of the normal experiences that we have in life, we then pathologize. Um, so I, there's a story someone told me about her hair cutter who said, oh my God, thank God, I just got um, diagnosed with ADHD. So now my husband has to be nice to me and not like get mad at me for being distracted and distractible. As if to say, for being human, we have to have a diagnosis. So I don't know if those two observations fit together, but as someone in psychiatry seeing the patients, I just wonder how your take on all this. Yeah, that's a great question. I grabbed I, I that a little bit in there. I think it's chapter eight. I talk about some of that. I, I think one of the one of the challenges with psychiatry, um, because it's been marginalized from many other parts of medicine, there's been a, there's been some movements to try and make it more medicalized, right? And to sort of um, sort of adopt the more medical model of psychiatry that you apply to medicine. The problem with that is that the medical model doesn't work that great for medicine. Uh, so, so that's my first my first thing. And so sometimes trying to, to so there's so many ways in which that's flawed. And we don't have time to go into it. And so I do think something can be lost um, by that. So my own approach to psychiatry, um, some people are some people really it's a mix. Some people really value a, a, a label if you want to call it that because it helps them sort of understand their experiences and, and sort of put something to it and make sense of it, right? Other people not so much. And so I'm I'm much I'm very flexible in how I approach it. So I'm not someone who's just going to jump to labels and think that some people it's really important for them to have that. Others just not, and so I'm more cautious when that's the case, because I know that labels can be um, helpful, but they can also be dangerous, right? And, and people can see a label in a chart and then they can just think that's that person without recognizing there's still a much there's a range of, of things and there's a fullness to a person that you can lose if you just get, get too sort of hooked up on labels. So I'm very kind of eclectic about that and very sort of flexible. Um, I don't even my first visit. I, I get in trouble with this a lot, actually. That first couple of visits, you know, they, they, I get these coders will tell me, "Well, what's the diagnosis?" Mm -hmm. You know, I will get that sort of thing, like because we got to build this thing. Um, so I actually get in trouble quite a bit with that. Um, uh, so I don't know. Maybe if, if you find that I'm having to do some of the work, it, you'll know why. It's, um, it's good trouble. <laughs> yeah. So it's, I get in trouble. I push, I push back because sometimes that first couple of visits, I just want to kind of get to know the person and understand, just understand them. And the most important thing is actually getting them to come back, right? Because like, you know, you can have all the medical knowledge in the world and know what, like a lot of times, a lot of times, you know, I've been doing this long enough, I might know in the first 20 minutes what I think the person probably is gonna need. But if, if, but if I can't like get the person to trust me and convey that in a way where they're actually gonna come back, it's not useful. That knowledge is just for it's my own sake and not to help someone. So I really often focus on that. So sometimes that gets me in trouble because I don't focus on labels so much. Um, at, least, at least not at the outset. So I can, it's, it's a mixed bag. So I, I, I do appreciate your points a lot, of, and I grapple with some of that in the book. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Yeah, I happen to know some people um, who are in healthcare, and you talk about the medical model and some of the problems with with that. Yeah. And they happen to be people of faith, and they're incorporating a model, a faith model. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find that interesting. And even at Duke, you might be aware that in the divinity school, there's a certificate program that's called, I'm going to say it in the wrong order, but I think it's um, theology, faith, and medicine. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And so I, I think they were doing some significant work. Yeah. And they even have a course in psychiatry and yeah. psychology uh, where medical professionals can look at the, how faith intertwines yeah. with this. And it's important because faith's important to a lot of patients. 
and I happen to be a medical interpreter, Spanish, English, okay. and if with with our patients, you know, the, the interpreter's patients, faith is a big factor. Uh, they they very much <laughs> refer, you know, to God in in a lot of their encounters, medical encounters, uh, and and so you know, I'm just wondering if that came up in any way in any of your uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I actually know some of those people you were talking about uh, who were in that Divinity School joint. Psych- uh, actually, yeah. no, the psychiatrist you're talking about. We were actually good friends. Um, so yeah. Um, I, yes, yes. We, we were we trained together, so I know Warren very well. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's a. Uh, I think there's a historically psychiatry and and sort of faith communities were actually often at, at odds. Yeah. You know, very much at odds. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, not in the service of helping people. You think about what well, this is my way of doing it. And this is their way of doing it, but. Really, maybe both can work together to really help people's needs the most. Again, I'm very—I don't have—I don't follow a particular ideology. I'm very sort of like, what's going to work best for this particular person in a situation. So I, I um, there are people that I mean, we have, we have a we have the a chaplains who are integrated on the team that I work with, and we do quite a bit of sort of back and forth. Um, because again, it's like, you know, you have to meet the person where they are. It doesn't matter what my thoughts are about the issue. It's about like, how am I going to meet this person where they are, and how can I help them? And how is this? How does your religious belief? Then how is that going to impact their approach to medicine and the medical care that they're going to receive? So I'm all about uh, that, you know, totally. Yeah, totally. It's really important. Yes. Um, and, and Warren is great, by the way. Yes. <laughs> He's got a book coming out, too, just so you know. I hope you do that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Before it was mentioned about a sick society, and so on, and I don't want to go into that, but you... There are people who have what I call everyday mental illnesses. They're just as a result of living as anxiety and depression and grief and all postpartum stuff and all those things that happen. And there are also people who seem to be natural healers. There are people who just go up to you and they're just there with you when you're hurting. And I'm wondering if there's a way to make use of those natural talents. Um, you know, I'm interested in global mental health, and in a place like India, you'll never have enough professionals. So they're training indigenous workers um, to do this. Yeah, there's some model that would like, but people may call peer support. There's some model that we see even in different medical settings where people, often with the peer support model, people themselves have had the similar experience. Like maybe they have some sort of mental health issue they will navigate it through. And they are, but they're not like medically trained in this sort of traditional way, but they're helping people um, navigate their own challenges. So that, that, that's, that, that, that's a model that's getting, getting increasing traction. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely, that's, so that's definitely something that's a flip. And I've read more about that in your international circles as well. Right. Yeah. Good, good question. Thank you. How do you grapple with the um, over medicalization in mm-hmm. psychiatry and kind of yeah. a slew of medications, especially to like the most marginalized and vulnerable populations and uh-huh. historical sure. um, impacts that have happened? You know, like there's a lot of things that sort of like psychiatry has been weaponized um, uh-huh. towards populations. And how do you grapple with that in your own practice and being right. a psychiatrist? Right. And, Perpetuating that system. Yes, great question. Yeah, there's some tension in there in the book about that. Yes, yeah, like, yeah, are you going to be part of the problem? Or are you going to be help trying to be part of the, you know, making things better? I certainly feel like personally, I've, there have been cases where I certainly feel like I've kind of undone things that were probably, like, I don't want to call it undone damage, but people who've been mislabeled with different diagnoses and I've sort of helped kind of go, go back and, you know, just give you the most one of the common example you hear about is like black men being overdiagnosed with schizophrenia and being over medicated is a common thing you hear about. I've certainly seen that. And I've certainly been in situations where I've helped to try and do my best to sort of rectify. You can't go back and change what happened in the past, but try and make it better for the, in the present and to the future. Um, but yeah, it's definitely an issue. I mean, so something that I, that, I, that I personally am always mindful of, I'm probably maybe the other end, maybe, maybe sometimes even too cautious. I'm going to be on the other side of it, but um, it's something that, that I do in my own practice and I try and do with the students and, and the residents that I train. Yeah, but it's, it's something very real. Lots of good questions. Oh, okay. All right, got the time down here. Yes, ma'am. 
Uh, you both had questions? Yeah, I guess I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I apologize if this wasn't your first one. Yeah. She's the professor. I'm not. Um, <laughs> I teach 12 year olds. Um, and just kind of curious, your perspective growing up, you know, there's a stigma attached to mental illness uh -huh. and mental health. Um, and I see that a lot with a lot of the students that I have from the cultural background they have, which are not similar to mine. And I'm just wondering, from your perspective of that compared to now, where you work in psychiatry, what advice would you have in terms of how to make them feel more comfortable with this aspect of themselves? Hmm. Make sure they're more comfortable with what aspect? They're, they're struggling. Uh, a lot of them think that, um, you know, if they talk about their mental health, it's something of weakness, kind of like you mentioned yeah. before. Um, I've been noticed that with quite a few of my students, um, that, you know, if they think that they're depressed or something, that it's, you know, something about weakness and they have to do better. Uh, so what, you wonder how much it, how much that they're getting from what's in their home, right? I mean, it's certainly, I certainly got some of those messages, I think, to at least um, to some degree. Um, you know, I mean, there's, there's no perfect fix, right? But I think there's there's definitely more efforts afoot for people to sort of, I mean, there's most public figures who talk about their challenges. I think that certainly can be helpful for, for some people to think about. Um, just, uh, I think the first step is just trying to understand, you know, why is it that, like, why do you think that that's, like, why is that weakness? Like, what's what's tying you to that to that narrative? I wonder if someone would have asked me that, like, as a young person, what I would have answered. And I'm trying to even think back to myself as a 12 year old, like, why would I have thought that that was weakness? Was it my peers? You know, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm wondering kind of what it was. Um, so I do think there's more opportunities now to, to, to see it differently. It doesn't mean everyone's going to have that exposure, but I think there's more opportunities for that. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a grant for you, but I think it's, yeah, it's, it's a tough question. But I think it might be just understanding, like, what is there, better understand why they might be feeling that way. Um, is it their, are their peers? Is it their family? I mean, that might give you some different directions of which way you could go. And you understand where it's coming from. And so it's like a daily double here. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Tweedy, for your talk. Um, I'm wondering about your writing process. Can you tell us, you know, you've now written two books. Uh, most of us can barely hope to write one. What's your process like, and how has that changed since writing your second book? Should I ask, like, the real writers here? No, I'm <laughs> I make stuff up. Well, it's a little different. <laughs> um, the writing process, yeah, it's a... Uh, um, I, I feel like it kind of just, um, it, feels, it feels like it's something at this point where I, I don't feel right if I don't do it almost, which is kind of a weird sort of, I don't know, just sort of how I sort of adapt it. I don't have a great system. So sometimes I will uh, do it at nights when the kids, after kids are going to bed, I'll do that way stretch and I'll get too tired and I'll take a break and I'll start getting up and doing it in the mornings. Um, but the thing that, but there's always, there's always, but for me it's always putting something down. The writing is a way for me to help kind of process uh, different sorts of experiences that I have. So that's sort of how it all kind of started. Even before I ever thought about ever writing a book, it was like the idea of like trying to process these challenging experiences. And that's where the writing sort of came in. But I, I'm not one of these, that, I guess if you want to ask like writing advice, the best thing I can tell you is you should always put down, like I tell myself, I'm going to put down like 300 to 500 words a day, no matter what. And so and for a while I would, I would track it. And sometimes those words are just total gibberish, but at least I, I put the words down. And so some days it might be zero, some days it might be 800. And so that means I can take a, you know, so I have, a, my goal is 300 words like every day. It doesn't mean every single day, but like on average. And so that's sort of the, the, the mantra I have, whether it's any good or not, you know, most times it's not. <laughs> that's the process. Hey, sir. I think one positive trend I've been seeing is uh, a lifelong sports fan Major League Baseball and NFL games, you're seeing more PSAs yes. about uh, mental health, mm -hmm. suicide prevention. Yes. And I think men being more likely to complete suicide uh, is something that we should really foster and celebrate and mm -hmm. push the pedal down on more. I think also, just real quick, like in, in my journey with depression and suicidal ideations, I think it's uh, really important for people to talk about how prevalent suicidal mm -hmm. thoughts are. Mm -hmm. And I see that because if you have them, but nobody else will admit it. Uh, then you think you're, you're the only one, exactly, and that, and that that really then justifies you taking action on it. Mm -hmm. So I think you know the, the increased discussion about depression is uh, is, is valuable, but the more we can acknowledge the prevalence of suicidal thoughts, mm -hmm. uh, the better we'll off. Be. Yeah, it's a great point. So I would just say because that's the you know um, I lost my train of thought. Uh, 
Gosh, that's such a good point. I love it. But you, you, make, you make really good points about that. I think, oh yeah, I know what say. So like, you know, one of the challenges with medicine and, and, and mental health is that there's, part of the marginalization is this idea that, you know, there aren't lab values attached necessarily to it. There's not like a, a this sort of scan. There's not these results. There's not a, like a physical exam finding that you can with certain things. And so that makes it, people think it's not real in some ways, right? Yeah. But of course, we think about the very realness. We know we know how real it is. We think about like suicide is obviously extremely real. How many rates of suicide are very high? Um, they have gone up. You know, the rates of problems with alcohol and drug problems are very real, right? These are very real problems. So we might wish that they weren't so, but they are, right? And so I think we have to really talk about that and grapple with it. That's what the whole sort of facing the unseen, that's what it means, right? This idea that these, these, are, these problems may be unseen in some way, but they're very real. And we have to sort of think about facing them. Um, one other point about suicide, I think really, in our language, and the way we talk about mental health issues is also telling. So think about some of the words we use. Um, and I, you know, I was guilty of this, and I talk about that candidly in the book. You know, we'll say you know, crazy, nutty, wacky. You know, these sort of like re re really words we use that refer to patients, you know, patients, not to their face, but like you know, in the, in the other room. Um, but even language we use about like, a, you know, like you think about someone who has a, a, a addiction, and you get a drug screen, and it's like, well, it's either clean or it's dirty. You know, even like the language we use, we say someone like you know, commits suicide. That's the word that was often been phrased when used for so long. You know, would you commit? Larceny, you could manslaughter, right? I mean, you know, you could, you know, when we say commit suicide, right? It, it, and so it's like this idea that it's a, you know, it's a criminal act. Um, and so I have this line in the book where I say, well, could we even, could we imagine suicide being more like um, a stroke than we could a sin? Could we even, can we, can we even imagine that? Because right now, historically, it's been thought of as like a sin, right? It's, 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 it's this horrible act. But could we even think about it in a different way? And what might that mean for how we talk about it? And so I think that's that's really kind of getting at this whole point about talking about these issues in a different way. Yeah, it's a really good point. In our uh, communication course uh, at, at UNC, students uh, do what are called critical incident reports, basically a, a difficult problem that raises a, a larger issue. And I, one student talked about a patient being labeled as difficult. And by, by virtue of the label of being difficult, it was uh, her impression that residents and attendings and other doctors who came to see the patient would spend as little time as possible because she's difficult and that uh, the, the label uh, did not show the full breadth of who that person was yeah yeah can I read the last section and then we'll just kind of I don't know because you're getting it is it okay if I do that yeah can, can, so, can I borrow a book can <laughs> so embarrassing <laughs> Let me read. It's like two paragraphs, and then I, I think they'll kind of kind of summarize a lot of kind of what this is all about. Although, of course, I left my glasses back there, and I'm 50. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll figure this thing out. Look at look. Oh, there you go. Those are my, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Woo! Boy, that looks a lot better. All right, so here we go. It's two paragraphs. It'll take like a couple minutes, and then we'll then we'll wrap up. Um, thanks, thanks a lot, folks. Uh, so here we go. Uh, body and mind, mind and body. For far too long, we've drawn a sharp line between them. For patients, it often means seeing your general medicine or specialty doctor in one part of town and your psychiatrist or psychologist in an entirely different area, or visiting the quote medical doctor on the first floor of a hospital or medical office and the quote mental doctor in the basement. For physicians, this separation has conditioned us to believe that quote body medicine is objective and clear cut while, quote, mind medicine is make-believe and less valuable. But as Doug Willie and so many others continue to show me each day I enter a hospital or clinic, there can never be a clean divide between our physical and emotional selves any more than we can live without a functioning brain and a beating heart. These and other essential organs all inhabit, inhabit one body that works in concert to experience all the joys and pains all the triumphs and tragedies of this thing we call human life. The more we can embrace this ethos as we enact laws, build hospitals, devise health systems, and educate the array of future healthcare workers who will one day face us and our loved ones in our greatest hours of need, the better off we will all be. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you for your time again. Thank you everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. This is really a great audience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.